Welcome back, I'm Matthew and this is part 3 of a series that I'm doing about setting up your smart home. This is the last of what I can only charitably call the theories of the smart home. These are videos designed to give you enough information about your opinions to help you take your first steps into setting up a smart home. For my smart home, I use Home Assistant as my smart home platform and all four of the wireless standards that are currently most active. That's Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, Zigbee, and Z-Wave. If you want to learn more about those options, and while I'm not including Thread or Matter, there's a link for it in the card or descriptions or whatever YouTube is making me put links in now. For me, the deciding factor for this setup are what I call the three laws of smart homes. Any device I bring into my smart home environment must meet at least two of these three laws, unless I really, really want it anyways. In order of importance to me, the laws are 1. The device has to add on to what already exists without interfering with the standard functionality. 2. The device has to be controlled locally. A loss of internet shouldn't mean I can't control a device that's right in front of me. And 3. The device can't be too expensive when compared to other similar devices. But those are just my three main criteria. As you are planning out your smart home, I highly encourage you to consider what it is most important to you and make your own foundational ground rules. Not only will building out your own laws prevent you from being shackled by what some random guy on the internet thinks, but they will also help you focus in on the core technology you want in your smart home, which is always helpful when you're first getting started. Plus, while I call it my three laws of smart homes, there's actually a fourth unwritten law, which is never be such a slave to the three laws that you miss out on a really useful piece of smart home technology. Regardless, for this video, I'm assuming that you've decided to use Home Assistant as a unifying smart home platform that your smart home will be built on. And the question becomes, what version of Home Assistant should you go with and what should you install it on? Now, I've used, to varying degrees, every version of Home Assistant except for Core. So I can, with a lot of confidence, say that the average user is going to want to install the Home Assistant operating system on a dedicated computer, maybe in a VM. If that's enough of an answer for you on which version of Home Assistant to use, then go ahead and skip to the computers chapter. If you want to decide for yourself after hearing what each version has to offer, then stick around and let's go over the four options starting with the most limited. Home Assistant Core is the most limited version of Home Assistant. It's a Python program that can run on top of other operating systems such as Linux, Mac OS, or even Windows using WSL. Home Assistant Core, like the name says, gives you the four core features of Home Assistant without a lot of the fluff. The first core feature it gives you are dashboards. Dashboards are essentially the graphical user interface for Home Assistant. They let you organize your smart devices and sensors into logical pages so you don't have everything just thrown on one giant page that you have to sort through anytime you want to do something. Second, Home Assistant Core lets you create your own automations. Now automations really are the heart and soul of a smart home platform. They let you control automatically your devices based on some set conditions such as movement detective, entering or leaving a certain area, the time of day, is the sun up, is it bright enough, what the temperature is, and really just so much more. Without automations, most of my smart home stuff would really just be a fancy way of doing mundane tasks like turning a light on or off remotely. The third thing Home Assistant Core lets you use is what Home Assistant calls blueprints. Now blueprints are scripts or pre-made and often very complex automations that let you create reusable tasks or notifications to make your life easier. For example, I have a blueprint that someone else created that will notify me anytime one of the batteries in my sensors gets below 15% so I can go ahead and replace that battery before it dies on me. And I have a different blueprint that slowly turns on a lamp in my room to simulate a sunrise so I wake up to a more natural way of waking up instead of with a harsh alarm in the middle of a sleep cycle. And finally, the fourth core feature that Home Assistant Core provides is the ability to use integrations. Integrations, like the name says, lets you integrate Home Assistant with some specific brand or device. And these are often scripts running in the background and doing all the heavy lifting for you. Integrations are how I communicate with my Unify devices, my Z-Wave and Zigbee devices, my security cameras, my sprinkler system. Seriously, the amount of devices that Home Assistant can integrate with is massive and growing every day. Of course, just because Home Assistant integrates with it doesn't mean you are controlling it locally. Some integrations rely on communications to a website to operate correctly, which means without an active internet connection, you won't be able to control devices through that specific integration. 
One additional feature that you can use even with Home Assistant Core is called the Home Assistant Community Store, or Hacks. Hacks provides unofficial integrations and front-end elements such as themes, custom cards, or other elements used by Lovelace. That's a graphical interface system used by Home Assistant. Hacks integrations and front-end elements are user-generated content that has not been officially tested and integrated into Home Assistant. As such, they require a bit more work to set up and could stop working if a future update from Home Assistant removes some feature that the integration relied on. Though, this tends to mainly happen when the Hacks integration is no longer being supported by the individual who made it. These four core features, plus Hacks, gives you almost everything you need to use Home Assistant. So what's the catch? Why not install Core on top of whatever computer you're already using? Well, a big reason is precisely because you're already using that computer for other things. Home Assistant isn't the most resource intensive thing out there, but as it grows, it's good to have some dedicated resources for it to use. If you press a button to turn on a light, a response time of more than a second or two becomes fairly noticeable. After all, it's one thing to have Home Assistant as a part of a computer that also runs other lightweight Docker containers or programs. But if you put it on your daily driver PC, you're probably going to notice it impacts your smart home experience, and maybe even the PC you're using for other things. The second and perhaps bigger issue is with Home Assistant Core, you won't be able to use any add-ons through Home Assistant. Where an integration uses scripts to provide communication with devices and services, sometimes to work with a device, you need more than just some random script. You need specific software packages and maybe even a backend database to keep track of installed devices that need to be kept isolated from other databases. Goodness knows you wouldn't want some poorly written script that was supposed to clean up your history logs, accidentally deleting out all your Zigbee devices from the database as well. And this is where add-ons come in. Add-ons are essentially Docker containers run by Home Assistant. Instead of a small script to communicate with an external MQTT broker, an add-on would be the entire software environment to be the MQTT broker, or SQL database, or DHCP server, or whatever combination of those things you require. And it houses that software in an environment that is isolated from the rest of the computer, where other add-ons or scripts can't mess things up. Additionally, with Core, you cannot create true backups of your system. I mean, you can make a backup with Home Assistant Core, but it's designed to be used as a migration path to Home Assistant Operating System. Or, in the worst case scenario, as a reference tool for you to manually restore your Home Assistant Core setup. It's not actually a way to automatically rebuild Home Assistant Core from a completely clean install. Next up in terms of how limited you are when you use it is Home Assistant Container. Home Assistant Container is the Docker version of the Home Assistant platform, and it can be run on any operating system that can run the Docker software. Now, if you've never used Docker, it's something similar to, and yet completely different from, a virtual machine. Instead of creating an entire virtual environment that uses dedicated resources to run any operating system you want, except Mac, a Docker container is a quasi-isolated, lightweight environment designed to let you quickly create and maintain dedicated applications that uses the host system resources on demand. That way, instead of over-allocating resources and having them sit there being wasted in reserves, or under-allocating resources and having the virtual machine lag, a Docker container uses exactly the right amount of resources as required in the moment. An additional benefit of a Docker container is that instead of you having to know what version of a Linux package you have to install to use some application, everything you need to run the application is contained inside the Docker container. So if one Docker container has an application that still uses Python 2, and another Docker container has an application that uses Python 3, the two applications won't fight each other. They'll just happily run inside their Docker containers. Home Assistant Container is a nice option for testing out Home Assistant, as it lets you quickly get things up and running, but it still has many of the shortcomings as Home Assistant Core. For example, you still can't use add-ons, and backups are still designed only as an upgrade path to Home Assistant operating system, and not as a means to restore your Home Assistant container install. And while updating it is as easy as redeploying your Docker container, the Docker updates can lag behind the current version just a bit, which can be a bit frustrating, especially if you're really excited to try out a feature that is in the next release. That said, I have seen a non-official version of Home Assistant Container in the works that is designed to let you use add-ons. I tried it out about, I think a year and a half ago, give or take, 
and at the time, you still couldn't use add-ons. But once you can, Home Assistant Docker will become much less limited. It still wouldn't be the version I personally recommend, unless you're a Docker guru though. My personal preference is to use Docker containers to create lightweight environments designed to do one task, such as be an MQTT broker or be your ZigBee or Z-Wave coordinator. Running something as complicated as Home Assistant in a Docker container, which is itself creating subcontainers with its add-ons, well, it's possible, but it creates a level of overhead that, in my opinion, needlessly complicates your IT life. Home Assistant Supervised is the full application version of Home Assistant and can be run only on Linux. I mean, okay, technically you can run it on Windows or Mac by creating a virtual machine that is running Linux and installing it on the Linux in the virtual machine, but that's getting a bit pedantic, I think. Home Assistant Supervised gives you full access to everything Home Assistant has to offer. Backups that can be used to quickly restore a botched update, or configurations, add-ons, supervisor, it's all there. Home Assistant Supervised is technically the least limited version of Home Assistant, as it not only gives you everything Home Assistant has to offer, but it also gives you full control over the underlying OS. But I still put it second from the top on my personal list, simply because it is slightly more complicated than Home Assistant operating system. Home Assistant Supervised makes you personally responsible for updating your underlying operating system and the software packages on it. Though not a given or even overly likely, it is possible that you can break your Home Assistant installation doing a kernel upgrade or even just a package update. Still, Home Assistant Supervisor gives you complete and total control over your setup. You install the Home Assistant software just like you would Plex or Beneath a Still Sky using Apt. Is what I'd like to say, but there are actually a few additional steps. Home Assistant Supervised exists for advanced users who want full control over their operating system. Already have a computer that they leave on all the time that they want to add Home Assistant to and want to do that without using Docker or a virtual machine to install the full Home Assistant operating system on. Finally, there's a Home Assistant operating system option. Home Assistant OS, or House, as you usually see it referenced, is the dedicated operating system version of Home Assistant, and it is the option that I recommend nine times out of 10. In my opinion, it is the option that gives you the most flexibility, while at the same time taking care of all the extraneous overhead you probably don't want to take care of anyways. Not only do you get every last feature Home Assistant has to offer, but House also makes sure that you have all the required packages installed and that you're using the ideal version of those packages. House makes it so that you can keep your operating system up to date without having to worry that updating some package is going to break your entire smart home. The downside, of course, is that House does require either a dedicated computer or a computer with enough power to run a VM on. Also, they very intentionally make it difficult to get to the underlying OS, since the very idea behind House is that Home Assistant handles all the operating system files you need to run Home Assistant, and it updates those files as it deems best. Now, ideally, you shouldn't ever need to access those underlying operating system files, but one potential side effect is that security patches may be delayed in being installed as the Home Assistant team evaluates the update and then releases it in the next core update. So which option is the best? Well, if you already use Docker and you just want to try out Home Assistant, give the Docker container a try. Odds are quite high that any add-on you'd want to use has a Docker option already, and you can spin that up with little issue. If you just want to see what it looks like but you don't use Docker, go ahead and install Core. You can still test out turning on some lights and running automations, even if you don't use the full install. And once you're really ready to get into Home Assistant, you can easily create a backup of your current settings and import them into one of the full-fledged versions of Home Assistant, such as Home Assistant Operating System. If you don't want to just try out Home Assistant and you're ready to get into things, I would personally recommend using the Home Assistant Operating System option. Unless you just really gotta have full control over the underlying operating system, in which case, use Home Assistant Supervisor and be ready for some headaches. And I get it, there might be some people who really disagree with my personal recommendations, such as the die-hard Docker fans, who think I am nuts to write off Docker the way I am. 
but my personal experience is that the Docker option often have these tiny little hangups that make it difficult for me to recommend it to anyone who isn't already familiar with Docker. And I have to admit, a part of my take on Docker is the fact that in one case, I was using Home Assistant Docker on a Synology NAS that restricted its USB usage, making it impossible for me to pass through my Zigbee USB coordinator into my Docker container. And the other time I tried it out, I was running on TrueNAS Scale, which kept uninstalling my Bluetooth stack anytime I updated it. The mere fact that I kept hitting those issues, though, is the very reason my go-to advice will always be to install Home Assistant Operating System on either a dedicated computer or in a virtual machine. A Docker container will always be subject to the whims of the operating system it's installed on. That's fine for lightweight applications, but can get complicated for larger, more complex applications like Home Assistant. Using Home Assistant Operating System is an incredibly stress-free solution. If I want to add in a Zigbee USB stick, I just plug it in my computer. If I'm running it inside a virtual machine, I tell my computer to pass that stick through to the VM and I'm done. No worrying about finding serial IDs or making sure it reconnects to the same USB location every time in Linux. It just works. But assuming I've sold you on running Home Assistant operating system on a dedicated computer or in a VM, what should you run it on? Well, for me, I'm running it on a VM on my server. This is my dual AMD Epic 7601 server running Proxmox. It has 512 gigabytes of memory and 10 10 terabyte hard drives for storage of all my personal and work files. Now, I personally needed something this powerful because for one, I have really big VMs that I have to keep backups of for my work, but two, I use low powered computers as thin clients that then use the power of this server to get things done. Of course, obviously, for most people, this would have been complete overkill. My Home Assistant VM only uses 5% of the eight cores I gave it, unless I'm doing something very CPU intensive, like compiling something for ESP Home. And it does it all using under eight gigabytes of RAM and on a 30 gigabyte hard drive. Home Assistant really doesn't need much to keep it going, but it does have some baseline requirements. For example, if you want to run it on a Raspberry Pi, then it needs to at least be the Pi 4 with 8GB of RAM. But there are a couple problems using a Pi 4. First of all, they can be hard to find at non-inflated prices. Fortunately, in recent days, the supply problems the Pi has been facing for the past, I don't know, several years now, seems to be lessening just a tiny bit, so it's not as hard to find. But for me, being able to find a Pi in stock can be hit or miss. And honestly, when they are in stock, they're often limited to one per customer, making it questionable if I really want to do a two hour round trip drive to my local micro center just to get the Pi being sold at non-inflated prices. The second, and to me, larger issue is that the Pi 4 8GB costs $75. Now, don't get me wrong here. I love the Raspberry Pi. In fact, for three or four years at the very beginning, I was a moderator on the Pi forums. Many of the guides there were first put together by me. I love getting to chat with the Pi team, and then I have two signed Raspberry Pis, a Pi 2 and a Pi 3 that I will never get rid of. The issue is that you need to use the right tool for the right job. So while I use a Pi in my van as a media server for my kids on road trips, I think it's the wrong choice for use with Home Assistant. And that goes doubly for something like a Home Assistant Yellow, which is a Pi 4 compute module on a board with an exposed M.2 slot and a built-on Zigbee module for $250! That's an insane price to me! Even if you like the idea of everything you need being pre-configured, provided all you need is Zigbee, I don't think that's worth an almost $200 markup on the Pi 4. Now, in the Pi's defense, you are not going to find a lower powered solution than the Raspberry Pi. It will only draw six watts even under full load, but assuming you can actually get the Pi 4 with eight gigabytes for $75, all you get is the Raspberry Pi itself. Once you factor in the cost of a power supply, an SD card, and all the other accessories you might want, and the shipping costs, you're looking more at about $125. And my personal take is that you can get a better system for the same costs. So here's my personal take. If you already have an old laptop or PC or Raspberry Pi 4 with 8 gigabytes of RAM just lying around, then use that. Make use of the resources you have right now. If, however, you have to go out and buy something, then look into getting a low-powered mini PC. If you want something that uses right about the same amount of power, then you might want to check out something like one of those cheap N95 PCs. 
They can be found all over AliExpress for about $125, and sometimes even on Amazon for about that price as well. If you don't mind just a little bit more power draw, but definitely better CPU and RAM options, then you might want to check out something like the Lenovo M715Q, which still only draws 60 watts under full load, but really idles at about 10 watts. Right now, these can be found on eBay for under $100 and usually include the power supply, at least 8 gigabytes of RAM, and sometimes a small hard drive as well. They have a built-in 1 gig NIC, plus built-in Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, and support both a 2.5 inch hard drive and an M.2 drive. Now, as long as you're not running it on a Raspberry Pi, my personal recommendation for your setup would be to install the operating system called Proxmox directly onto the repurposed laptop, your N95 PC, or the low-powered small form factor PC such as the Lenovo M715Q. Then use Proxmox to create one VM to run Home Assistant and another VM to run Docker, which of course will run all your lightweight applications such as Mosquito, ZigBee2MQTT, or Z-Wave2JS. For the same amount of money you would have spent to get a brand new Raspberry Pi that could only run Home Assistant, you will have a small form factor PC that uses very little electricity, can run Home Assistant, several Docker containers, provide web filtering using PyHole or AdGuard Home, hosts all your R containers, and even runs Plex with hardware decoding. If you do get the Lenovo, just make sure you get a unit that has a Ryzen CPU and not an AMD Pro or Athlon CPU. The Ryzen CPU will get you significantly better performance. But I'm only using the Lenovo Mini PC as an example. There are a ton of these Mini PCs that are being sold on eBay right now. Search around for some tech reviews and make sure there's not a better deal out there. Channels like Serve the Home do a great job reviewing both newer and older Mini PCs. And if you've never heard of Proxmox or the thought of managing VMs overwhelms you, relax. While I have a server that runs all my stuff, I actually bought one of these Lenovo M715Qs for myself. I'm going to walk you step by step through the process of installing Proxmox, installing VMs, passing through your Zigbee and Z-Wave USB stick to it, setting up Home Assistant, everything you could ever want for an initial setup. We're going to walk through it together one step at a time. Because every home should be a smart home, and together I think I can help make yours just a bit smarter. Thanks for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, please be sure to hit that like button and share it with your friends. If you haven't subscribed yet, I hope you will, and be sure to hit that bell icon to be notified of all the updates I do on this channel. If you want to support the work I'm doing here, then I hope you'll consider becoming one of my Patreons, where you'll get early access to all kinds of videos. And until the next time, may the Lord bless you and keep you, may he cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you, may the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace, Amen.